Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, uh, welcome to this meeting. On behalf of the ACT Alliance and our members, Church World Service and Churches Auxiliary for Social Action in India, OCASA, I am very pleased to welcome you all today. I am Jasmine Huggins and I will be the moderator for this session. The webinar will be 90 minutes long. We will use an interview format and our speakers will use uh, slides to illustrate their points. We will then have time for a discussion where you can put your questions directly to speakers. Uh, we will then briefly summarize the main points raised. First, some housekeeping notes. The webinar will be recorded and we will start recording now. Uh, we welcome you to turn your camera on and we ask that you keep your microphones muted throughout the session. For the question and answer part of the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them directly into the Zoom, the Zoom by using the chat function. Please identify if you are putting this question to Joyce Thea, Mary, or Andrew, or, or, to, or any of them, or all of them. First, an introduction to who we are. ACT Alliance is the world's largest Protestant and Orthodox network. It coordinates and advances humanitarian assistance development and advocacy. Church World Service and CASA are both members of the Alliance. For us at the ACT Alliance, the fight against climate change is as much about climate justice as gender justice. We recognize also that the COVID-19 pandemic is further burdening already marginalized communities in both the developing and developed world. It is clear from the work that we do that climate change impacts and the virus have disproportionately affected some groups. But although this evidence is increasing, governments, donors, and agencies still do not put these groups at the heart of their policies and programs. Neither do these groups receive the critical financial flows that they need to ensure their participation, protection, and the full enjoyment of their human rights. The speakers here today are concerned about this because they can see the increasing impact of these global crises on the communities with which they work. They also know that decision makers, governments, legislators, multilateral organizations, and donors need to better understand how these dynamics play out at community level and for individuals. In addition, as COP26 is now scheduled to take place this November in Glasgow, the ACT Alliance is working with its members around the world to identify the most important actions, messages, and demands from our ecumenical community to the leaders around the world who have the responsibility for scaling up climate action to the ambitious levels necessary to prevent further suffering, loss, and damage. This is why we are having this conversation, timely conversation today, we, and we are fortunate to have three experts who will help us to explore this topic further. Dr. Joyce Thorat is the project desk and project officer at CASA in India and co-chair of the ACT Alliance Advisory Group on Advocacy. She has worked on food security, climate change, disaster risk reduction, gender and peace building with grassroots communities, especially youth, Dalit, tribals, and women. Dr. Tharat has represented CASA in national and international congresses in 10, 22 countries on climate change, gender, social security programs, advocacy and rights, including at the UN level. She has a master's degree in two fields of knowledge in psychology and English literature, and her doctoral thesis was entitled Gender Differences, Leadership Style and Contribution to Social Justice, a Study of Global Ecumenical Leaders. Joyce, mm -hmm. welcome. So mm -hmm. thrilled to have you. Mary Obiero is the Director of Relief and Development and Protection at Church World Service Africa and has 20 years experience in water, sanitation and hygiene or WASH. Food security, community livelihoods, education, youth empowerment, emergency response and disaster risk reduction management with gender sensitivity, sensitivity lenses in Africa. Prior to this, Mary worked as Senior Regional Program Coordinator at CWS Africa where she oversaw CWS's Water for Life, Improved Livelihood, and Integrated Together program for 11 years. Before joining CWS Africa, she worked with Danish Volunteer Services, Moore University, and the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Mary has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Kenyatta University. And I believe we're still having difficulty getting Mary into the room. Hopefully she can join us soon. 
Andrew Fuels serves as Senior Director of the Global Migration at CWS, and we are a faith organization that works with communities around the world to respond to hunger, poverty, displacement, and disaster. Andrew has worked with CWS for 12 years, including as Associate Director for its Immigration and Refugee Programs and as Interim Regional Coordinator for CWS Africa. He has worked with CWS teams and partners in more than a dozen countries to design humanitarian response and development activities, evaluate program results, and undertake research on migration and displacement. Currently, Andrew is working with CWS staff and partners in five countries, Cambodia, Georgia, Haiti, Indonesia, and Kenya, to document local perceptions of climate change and links between climate and migration. Before joining CWS, Andrew served as policy officer with the International Land Coalition and as program officer with the Asia Division for the National Democratic Institute. He has a master's degree in public policy from the University of California. Welcome, Andrew. We are thrilled to have all of you here uh, for this very important conversation. And I'll kick off uh, immediately with Joycea. Joycea, can you describe how climate change is affecting your community and or your region? Let me begin by expressing my sincere thanks and appreciation to CWS at Act Alliance for organizing this very important parallel event uh, and a very important topic at the intersection of climate change and gender-based violence lies women and girls. CASA is very happy to be part of this discussion as we are also very actively engaged at the ground and working on a day-to-day -day basis on these very important and critical issues. Let me begin by saying India, yes, is on the top of climate change. India faces some of the highest disaster risk levels in the world, ranked 29 out of the 191 countries by the 2019 Informed Risk Index. India was the seventh most affected by the devastating impact of climate change globally in 2019, according to the Global Climate Risk Index. Very high exposure to flooding, including riverine, flash, and coastal as well as high exposure to tropical cyclones and their associated hazards and drought. With the current glacier burst in February this year, the recent one, so many of them died and we recovered uh, many body parts and missing persons. This is something was very, very serious uh, emergency in India in the recent time. Cyclone Fani, 16.53 million people were affected and uh, uh, 5,8,467 eight houses damaged, 18,168 villages devastated, and livestock and agriculture and livelihood, and forest and sanctuary areas destroyed. Pawnee affected 28 million people, killing nearly 90 people in India and Bangladesh, and causing economic losses to US dollar 8.1 billion. Super cyclone Amphan, uh, in Bodhisattva and Bangladesh, 118 fac uh, fatalities and US dollar 13.5 billion power grid damages, US dollar uh, 42 million uh, uh, cost and 500 homes were destroyed and 15,000 uh, 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 damage plus li livestock in the Sudar Bens. World's highest maximum temperature with an average monthly maximum of around 30 degree centigrade and an average uh, of May maximum uh, degree of 36 uh, degrees centigrade is fine in India. Every year, the climate, uh, the heat is increasing. Floods are on an average the greatest source of annual loss to disaster in India, costing an estimated uh, $7 billion every year. 86% of all deaths from uh, tropical cyclones are accounted for in India and Bangladesh. Storm drainage infrastructure is vulnerable to being overloaded and cause flooding, even the cities, which will have adverse impacts on human health and the local economy. By 2030, it is estimated that the agriculture losses in India will be over $7 billion and affect 10% of their population's income. Nearly two thirds of India's population depends directly or indirectly on the agriculture sector for their livelihood. And 60% of the cultivated areas being rain fed agriculture production is strongly influenced by climate variability. I would like to bring in here an ex experience. When I visited the field, one time a farmer had to share. He had sown seeds three times. Farmers know when the rain arrives and he sowed the seed looking at the sky, there will be rain. The second time uh, the, the rain did not come. He lost all his seeds. Second time he again sowed and there was no rain. Third time he sowed. He was so devastated. Uh, seeds they purchased by uh, borrowing money 
So three times to buy seed and everything is lost. It's a great, uh, you know, a, a devastation for farmers. These are some direct examples which we face when we when we are in the field. And these pictures shows, shows the recent cyclone Arfan, the Uttarakhand glacier burst and cyclone Fani. And the next slide talks about the key natural hazards. Uh, the statistics from 18, uh, 1985 to 2018, where we can see storm, flood, earthquake, drought, epidemic, and land, landslide, and extreme temperatures are on the rise, and the millions of people who have been dying, the number increasing every year because of the uh, climate crisis. So it is real in India, and the people, especially the poor and the marginalized, and who are the most drought-trodden, who are out of the uh, who are in the margins are mostly affected by these climate issues. I will stop here for the time being. Thank you, Joyce. Yeah, those are staggering, staggering statistics. Um, so worrying. Um, let me turn that question directly to Mary now. Mary, so glad that you've been able to join us. Mary, can you say from your uh, community and region how is climate change affecting? Uh, how are you seeing climate change manifest in your area? Thanks. Sorry, I joined a bit late, and I want to share uh, the story of Africa on climate change and gender uh, equity. Uh, the story starts for a very long time. Historically, we have had drought in the region, and this has continued for a very long time, but now as we speak, what has changed actually is the frequency of uh, the drought floods or climate vulnerability and the how severe this has become. Traditionally, drought appeared maybe in 50 years. And when there is drought, definitely there is famine. And when there is famine, then that means that the woman, the girl is the most affected. I want to say, uh, to tell a story that my grandmother shared with me when I was a very, uh, very young girl. My grandmother shared with me stories about women who are married in our communities and people did not know their origin. And basically when we would ask, would be told that those women were sold during famine. That means that we have had these challenges for a very long time. And when there was famine, then the families would actually turn and sell off their young girls to communities that actually had food. And we have, have, we have had these women living in communities that they did not know, and they could not actually trace their original background where they came from. So what has changed currently is that now we are having this uh, drought, we are having floods on a continuous basis. As we speak, I think from 2016 to date, Kenya has suffered from drought every year, and some parts of the country we have suffered from floods every year. What this means is that women and girls are most affected because within our communities, then like, for example, if I would give an example of Kenya, by 2014, we had 50% of Kenyan women who had not acquired a secondary school education. In Africa, and I think globally, education is related to someone being able to earn a living. That means being able to engage into profitable, or livelihoods and make money and be able to live on, on their money. So that means that in, in, in this part of the world, women have very limited resources. And when there's drought, then they're the most affected. When there is a, a flood, they're the most affected. Currently, we are even having locust invention due to uh, climate change related challenges. Uh, we have had this for the last three years and women are the ones who are doing the farming in the, in, 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 the, in the farms, and when they cannot harvest their crops, then definitely they are the ones, they are the ones who are most affected. So climate change has a number of effects on, on women in the sense that uh, when there is also drought, men move out of their homes to go and look for dress, grazing land. They also move out of their homes, including young, young men, they move out of their homes to go and look for, 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 for employment in, in neighboring cities. And that means that the woman is left in charge of her family. And in Africa, we still have large families. We have areas where we have an average household having a number of eight people. 
And for that case, a woman will be left to feed uh, her children, which will be maybe six, seven, or even sometimes 10, without any source of income. And this becomes really, really difficult. And for women who are single, women who are divorced, and women who are separated, they also lack a they, they also get themselves in a situation where they do not have resources. And for that reason, then if we have uh, if we have climate change related challenges, then they, they suffer most. So basically, we'd be looking into how best we can be doing, can be working with women, and how we can support women and girls to be able to to achieve uh, their potential. And this affects girls more in the sense that if there's drought, if there's famine, then the girls are not going to school. They're actually the first one to be dropped out of school. They're the first ones who, who face early marriages, as I said earlier, and the girls will actually now be working with their mothers to make sure that they get some food for, for the household use. We are also living within the region where we have a lot of uh, resource-related conflicts. We have wars in countries like Somalia. We have wars in, in countries like uh, DRC, that is the uh, Republic of, of, of Congo. And we have wars in countries like South Sudan. And most of those wars actually uh, are resource-related wars. And in this case, then we get women being on the move, migrating from their countries. When we get to the refugee camps within Kenya, within Tanzania, and within Uganda, we are finding out that we have the highest population in the refugee camps, they're the women. We have more women-headed households in these refugee camps, meaning one, their husbands died in war, or even if they did not die, then the women actually left without necessarily having to live with their spouses, and they have found themselves into refugee camps. And in these refugee camps, there are a number of issues that are going in. We have a lot of gender-based violence that has continued. And these women have also found them, themselves in a situation where they are continuing to have children in the refugee camps. And most of these children do not have actually their, their, their fathers. Unfortunately, within the region, apart from Uganda, I think when I look at Kenya, I look at Tanzania, most our refugee camps are in very, very dry areas, areas that really struggle to receive even a drop of rain like I was just speaking to someone in Kakuma refugee camp and they say they have not received rain for the last 11 months. And for that reason, even if the refugee has uh, access to some land to till, they cannot till that land because they have not received any rainfall. So for that reason, then the women find themselves in very awkward position. And sometimes they engage into activities that are not uh, maybe acceptable to themselves and to the society around them like um, commercial sex work just to be able to get food and put on the table. I think all of us are aware that uh, resources to respond to emergencies and refugee related activities are really reducing. And at the moment we are, we are realizing that the World Food Program is reducing food rations in all the refugee camps. To some extent, 68%, to some extent less than 68%. And for that reason, if we have a woman in the refugee camp with more than eight children, then it becomes really difficult. And all these are actually uh, related to climate change, climate vulnerability, and the fact that we have destroyed our environment to the extent that we cannot produce enough to eat from our ecosystem. So I'll stop there and then I'll be looking into what CWS has done to be able to support uh, this type, to respond to and to be able to support to this type of scenarios. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, again, staggering statistics and, uh, and you're painting a very worrying picture. Um, you've raised the issue of refugee camps and people on the move. Um, I want to come back to that and I will ask Andrew to speak to that point. But before we get there, um, Joyce, Mary spoke um, about the uh, how climate change affects women and girls and uh, is affecting the the quest for gender equality in her area. Can you say a little bit more about the, how that plays out in your area? Thanks. Yes. Yes. Uh, as we know, uh, most of the responsibility for food, water, fuel 
and uh, meaning the scarcity of these resources have obvious impact on the women. Women have to walk miles in rural area in India where they have to go searching for water, which is mostly drought prone. And then mostly men migrate for work and women are left with higher burdens of responsibility. This increases violence against women when there is uh, in our, uh, when there is strain for resource and it reinforces existing power imbalances within communities and individual households. There is an interesting uh, story like uh, there was a report in India when there was water issues, water problem, drought. Women, women, men were marrying uh, uh, more women, water wives they were called, basically to support the water requirement so that they can go long distance and collect. He had one or two more wives, more water at home. And human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of women rises in the aftermath of climate change as traffickers look, uh, to, look to target vulnerable communities. We have a lot of experiences when there is a drought situation or when there is flood, when there is emergencies, there is so much of rise in terms of uh, trafficking of the girls, young girls. Young daughters are normally married off to reduce burdens after the disaster. This we are very much seeing during this COVID situation as well. So many young girls who should have been in school. Now there is no school, there is no resource, there is no jobs. Young people are married. Where Casa has some of the schools for the small children, uh, where we are working with child laborers. Young girls are married off. And when we are visiting homes and trying to find out, they're saying parents are just forcing us to get married because they have no other option. And after all the disaster, women and girls are still vulnerable as emergency responses may or may not be safe even for them. Many times uh, the emergency responses are, you know, like for water, they try to ask for sex. Hydropatriarchy is a, a thing which is very much prevalent in India where men are... Uh, uh, mostly the custodians are have the water resource and women are supposed to kind of go and be up to them and they have the control and women have not much of decision making power in terms of water, how it is distributed and especially this affects the most vulnerable women like the Dalit women where the high caste men and high caste communities don't want to share the water with the women. Limiting girls' adaptive capacity to climate change and disasters, lack of access to education and swimming. Like during the tsunami, we found many of the young girls, because of the social norms, they were not much allowed to go out and swim and not wear different dresses. You know, they are used to the local traditional dresses, which were, you know, limiting their uh, mobility. And because of that, they were, many of them died. Many of them didn't know swimming, which also affected them. Women are also disproportionately affected by environmental degradation due to industrial mining. Like in areas in Darkin and Chattisgay, where there is forest and mining, where uh, women are looked upon as the natural guardians. And when they are not able to do that, they are also uh, affected because of that. Impact on women's livelihood. There is a, a survey in India, which is done, which is also proved by our uh, visits and our uh, data that between 2011 and 2016, 9 million interstate migration pattern has happened. Male agricultural laborers dominate migration. Women form, uh, form of a stay back at home and most affected during the agrarian crisis. And in 2019, even report found that women are still underrepresented in decision making and climate change with the problem even more prevalent. This is very much even in our local community. Women do not have much say how the water should be used or how the resource should be allocated. So it is very important we continuously engage uh, women in these kind of uh, work. And especially we ask women to be participating in the decision making. And we also know, I want to highlight here also the fault line, which is already there. In every disaster, women are affected disproportionately because already they are uh, in the most vulnerable section. They are, they are mostly the women from the marginalized communities like the tribals and the Dalits and the rural women are mostly affected. And for them, they are already poor uh, they are already poor because uh, they have very not only just because they have low income but they also have the multi-dimensional deprivation like hunger undernutrition dirty drinking water illiteracy and have no access to health services social isolation and exploitation and this number only increases during emergencies and they will be uh, uh, also women are lagging behind much more because they are economic and social status are much behind Women are affected disproportionately in, even in this pa pandemic with visa and transgenders and LGBT community did not have much of uh, support because of that. Uh, women, this is also as they have more intra-household distribution uh, the uh, work to do. They are also expected to do the childcare and elderly. This become even more during any emergencies. And this also uh, uh, reflects in uh, all the other inequalities which they face. 
uh, we also have seen in one of the latest Oxfam report where the care work, you know, where the care work inequality has made women uh, suffer even more. The girls and women put 12.5 billion hours of unpaid care work each and every day, which amounts to US dollar 10.8 trillion a year. More than three times the size of the global tech industry. Imagine during a disaster situation, men move out to city or anywhere and the women are left to take care of everything, household as well as the farm, as well as the money which they have to uh, make in order to take care of their uh, livelihood. Uh, so this is the situation of women uh, uh, when it comes to disaster and they are become more and more vulnerable during an emergency situation. And during this pandemic, we have also seen that how it has affected the uh, women. And uh, they are out of school and they have no source of income and they are uh, pushed to the uh, margin. And there's a lot of uh, backlash on women due to this pandemic, along with the other emergencies with them. Thank you. And uh, if I, hmm? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, if I can add some more about uh, how it affects uh, man and, uh, men and uh, men also, uh, I can add that as well. Uh, we will come back to that because we do, okay. we do, we do need to spend some time on that. Um, thank you, Joycea. Um, you've raised so many important points um, that I hope we will be able to come back to um, in the Q and A. Um, Andrew, Mary has already spoken about the impact of climate change in refugee camps and and also on how climate disruption is is impacting on migration. Um, can you say more about that? Sure. Thank, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jasmine. Um, and it, it's it's a it's a privilege to be be part of this discussion today. <clears throat> to be <clears throat> to be on a panel with with um, with very talented and expert women. Um, I see that there's a, a number of people in the, the audience, so I'm looking forward also to to hearing and learning from from those of you who are who are participating in the session today for for church world service we've we've long responded um to to the needs of people on the move um to lift up the the dignity uh, rights um of refugees migrants uh we've also have a, a i think a long history of, of working alongside communities uh to build on um build on strengths in, in responding to to local development needs um and, and increasingly in looking at how uh, climate resilient approaches can can help um, help respond to, to to economic social needs that, that communities have. Um, we've more recently begun an intentional look at how these two themes are are connected: uh, climate change and, and migration. So some of what I'll be sharing today is coming from um, our own review of of what's already been documented. Some of it's coming from from a community research that CWS now has underway, Jasmine mentioned at the, the beginning, we're, we're working on this in, in five countries, including with, with Mary and her team in, in CWS Kenya, um, looking at, at not only what are the connections between, between climate change and migration, but also how people are perceiving um, the opportunities, the challenges, the costs, the benefits of adapting in place, of migrating, uh, whether there's migration is being seen as a coping mechanism or an adaptation, whether there's feedback loops between migration to support resilience, um, how migration might be posing challenges to improving climate resilience. Um, and one reason that, that we've been uh, investing our, our energy and, and resources on this is that it's, it's increasingly apparent and, and known that, that broadly speaking, climate change is having an impact on uh, where we live, where we move, how we move, uh, whether we can move. Um, You'll see on the screen here a number of the, the kinds of hazards that, that we're tracking um, that affect, affect us either directly, direct, directly affect our bodies, our homes, um, our assets, um, or sometimes just affect us more indirectly and, and often through, um, through the way that, that we earn a living and for people who depend directly on natural resources, particularly in rural areas for, for livelihoods. Um, it's often the indirect effects of, of climate change on ability to, to, to farm, to earn an income, um, where people are really feeling, feeling the pressures most acutely. Um, globally speaking, I think if you could, um, Diana, if you could, wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide. Uh, sorry, I might be jumping around here. Glo globally speaking, there's, I think, a number of, of 
projections and analyses of, of not only what's happening now, but what we could expect in the future. Um, for me, one of the key messages that I've taken away from these is that there really is still a window now to invest in, in mitigation, reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, invest in inclusive development, inclusive approaches to adaptation that will reduce the number of people who may be forcibly displaced by, by climate change. Um, there's a good study by, by the, the World Bank that came out a few years ago um, that projected, uh, used, used sort of the projections um, of what are the range of, of possibilities on, on climate mitigation and also the range of possibilities in terms of development scenarios. Um, and it's a, pretty, it's a pretty wide range at the high end, uh, projecting 143 million people who would be forcibly displaced. That's if we continue with business as usual in terms of climate mitigation, business as usual in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, the kinds of exclusions that, that people are facing. Um, but with, with really robust uh, change, uh, that number could come down almost by a factor of five. So for me, that's a really big takeaway that, that there's still a window to, to make a difference and to affect the, the future trends. Um, but that low end projection is, is 31 million people, which is still a really, a really significant number. Um, when we think that, that currently um, there's close to 80 million people worldwide who are, who are forcibly displaced by violence and persecution. Um, there's 24 million people who were displaced um, in 2019 because of weather related disasters. So adding onto that um, impacts, particularly from slow impact climate change, um, that's going to increase the need for, for responses in both within countries and across borders um, to ensure that people who are on the move have, have access to rights and dignity and, and safety. Um, a few other trends that I'll just mention here to, as, as a backdrop for, the, for our, our discussion. One is that there's a lot of, um, the evidence that exists now uh, is showing that, that people are typically moving inside their countries in response to climate impacts and particularly the slow onset climate impacts. Often people who are on the move because of climate change, um, climate is one of the factors related to migration. It's not necessarily the only factor. People are moving through the existing channels that are there, um, including when, when crossing borders through the kinds of mixed migration channels that people who are also fleeing other forms of, uh, other forms of uh, insecurity, human insecurity, uh, violence, persecution, other economic distress may be accessing. And so people may be exposed to the same kinds of uh, threats and challenges uh, that others on the move are facing. Um, there's also a growing concern of, of risks of people being trapped in place, whether families or, or whole communities being trapped in place because of not having the resources to move out of harm's way. Um, and that often we're, we're seeing that migration takes resources. It's an investment that people people uh, can make. So, so it's not necessarily an option that's available to, to people in a community who have the least resources of all. Thanks, Andrew. Really, really helpful um, overview of the intersection between uh, climate and migration. Uh, you've raised a lot of points that I want to come back to, hopefully also in the discussion. Um, but before we go there, I want to go back to uh, Joycea's uh, point about the, uh, the impact of climate change on men and boys and, and other groups. Now, obviously, when we say gender, uh, obviously because of patriarchal structures, because of, of uh, gender stereotyping and conditioning, both Mary and Joyce and Andrew have, uh, and, and also Andrew have, have all said that uh, women and girls are particularly affected, but we know that gender means, everybody, the gender means, men and women, boys and girls, and also we have the issue of gender fluidity and um, LGBTQI. So I want to start this section looking a little bit more at how climate change affects men uh, and boys and gender fluid people. I'll start with Joycea and then Andrew and uh, Mary, I want to, we'll, we'll come back to you, we'll come back to you. So starting with Joycea, boys and men. Yeah, uh, basically uh, found an interesting study about how climate change can also really, you know, make uh, more boys be born in the heat regions and then cold places there could be more women. But more interestingly, in India, we see parents don't want to have girl child. You know, it is also because they find it as a big burden. 
and with all the climate effects and with the low income and no scope of and say, like uh, 70% 70 to 80 percent of the community is engaged in uh, agriculture and agriculture is mostly rain fed and it is like you know they totally depend on the rain it all affects the whole psychology and the whole mindset of the people though they don't want girls at all and uh, this is one of the uh, reason which can uh, later as like you know in certain part of the country there are not proportion of male to the female which is affecting what they have to find uh, for marriage and so on and so forth increase and in out migration of men especially those who are socioeconomically vulnerable from rural india to when they come to cities moving out leaving their fa family back home they don't have a place to say, stay in cities like where well, in maharashtra when they move to mumbai they are always on the platform they have uh, they they have to live a very very difficult life and mostly men are expected to migrate and move out of the home look for job and send some money back home as people are dying there so this is a very uh, expectation of the men that they have to make money and men male farmers increase tendency of dying by suicide kasa is working in two very sensitive suicide prone area where a lot of farmers are committing suicide there are women who are also doing farming women are also part of the farming we know there are many women farmers but men mostly commit suicide large number of men so continue to commit suicide because of this uh, situation you know and because they feel the burden of the family responsibility they borrow money they are not able to pay back because of two consecutive droughts and situation like that and then they end up taking their life then again it goes back to women uh, to look after the whole family but yes the male psychology and the men feeling so you know not able to fulfill their responsibility so this is one of the biggest problem on men and uh, materialistic expectation during disaster lead them to dive into dangerous territories and risky behavior especially for young boys and also in the uh, recent uttarakhand the experience we found one family one man waited near the glacier the entry of a, a big tunnel where a lot of workers were working he waited till the end to rescue more than 10 20 of his staff and he ended up dying when he had a family with two small children and one baby on the womb so it was such a moving story to hear how men at one side they feel it is their you know, responsibility as men to protect and also a little bit of heroism around that because in emergency we say first you have to take care of yourself and then you try to save others but here yes it is exemplary to save and protect and safeguard but yes this also affects mostly men and masculinization of spending in wilder we this is one thing which we find in rural maharashtra rural india alcoholism when they have nothing no money and they are more vulnerable position they even get, get tend to drink more borrowing or you know finding any way so this becomes an one more addiction spoils their health and family becomes more vulnerable and during climate disaster men and boys are expected to be unafraid heroic and so on and you know this is the natural tendency that they have to kind of protect everybody so this also becomes an additional uh, factor how boys and men are affected during disaster situation thanks joycea um andrew the the issue the issue of socialization gender fluidity uh the need for protection of special groups during climate migration could you tell us a little bit more about why it's important for us to include all groups when we do gender analysis thanks thanks jasmine and i'll i'll follow from from dr joycea's um uh, comments that that i think in some of the the background research that that we're doing um to accompany our, our community research, we're seeing very similar patterns. Um, I'm, I'm remembering a, a study um, that the Indonesian Institute of Sciences did in, in a part of the country that's that's being affected by, by drought in Lombok Island, um, where it was the researchers found connections between the impacts of, of drought on, on men who, who are farming or working as, as farm workers um, and decisions to, to to migrate, including migrating um, internationally for, for, for work opportunities. Um, meanwhile, women, as, as men are migrating out, especially as, as spouses are, are leaving, are taking on more work outside of, outside of the home, um, in, including in, in types of work, um, cleaning, cleaning fish, working as, as sort of the, the front line of the, the 
fish processing sector um, that it, that are relatively new in terms of spaces for for women in that in that part of the country. But what what the the researchers found was that for 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 women the adaptation was was very successful and that that many times they were able to cover the the, the costs not only of of households. Um, but also of, of costs that their husbands are incurring to, to migrate. Um, whereas for men, it was, it's risky financially, whether you're gonna be able to, to earn what you're looking for um, in context of migration. Some men were successful, some weren't. Um, but also that there are, there are threats that people face, especially for, for men who don't have much of a familiarity with, with migration, with international migration, um, getting, getting connected with the wrong the wrong sources of information or, or unscrupulous uh, migration brokers um, can can pose pose threats that that, that people may not be be aware of, um, and that may that may be not because of the, the the experience of of climate change on livelihoods per se, but on what are the expectations that people may have, and why is it that that women uh, in in this part of the country are are adapting very well, staying in place, and men maybe. Uh, Maybe having a more mixed experience in terms of adapting adapting through migration. Um, from some of the, the community research that, that CWS has been doing in in Cambodia and Batambang province, I think we've we've been hearing from both men and women very similar stories of how climate change is 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 being felt, um, largely because both men and women are are engaged in agriculture, and so people are feeling it through. Uh, how changes in weather, especially changes in rainfall, are affecting their daily lives. One of the, the kinds of stories we hear, um, extreme hot, extreme cold weather, uh, unpredictability of rain, increased drought. This is all making it difficult, um, difficult to farm, difficult to earn income through farming. Um, we don't have good irrigation. We need to improve our access to year-round water. Um, women are also migrating. It's not only men from, from these communities. Uh, what I... What I had been picking up on from looking at the responses, uh, women may be a little more likely to be, be to be naming the kinds of uh, family responsibilities that Dr. Joycea was was describing in terms of a, a factor in decision making. Uh, so it may be that it, that that uh, all things being equal, I have I have uh, responsibilities for for my parents, for my children, um, and I'm viewing that in a different way than than maybe my husband would or my brother would. And that would affect the way I'm considering trade-offs for, for, for investing in staying in place or investing in migration. Um, one other thing this, this I think is, is pointing to is that women are farming. Women, women are definitely farming in the, in the communities where CWS is, is working and where we're, we're doing uh, this research alongside support to, to, to climate adaptation. I don't know that, that women's roles and leadership in farming is necessarily Visible, and if if that's not the case, then that will pose other challenges in terms of ensuring access to the kinds of adapt, adaptation support uh, that women farmers will need in order to to succeed as the climate continues to change. Really helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think you both, uh, you and Joyce, have um, represented very well why, in our gender analyses, we need to include all all uh, all the genders. Um, very helpful detail as well. Mary, I want to come back to you because I know that in your work uh, in Kenya and West Pokot, you have been working with both men and women, boys and girls over the last 10 years, specifically to address uh, FGM. Can you say a little bit more about how climate change uh, impacts differently on men and women, but how can you say a little bit about what you have experienced in your work um, in addressing FGM with both men and women, boys and girls. Thank you. Looking at uh, how the climate change has affected uh, all the gender, I think I want to start by speaking on boy child. And I want to make it very clear that um, there's so much going on about girl child in the region, Kenya and other countries around East Africa, but there's very little that is being said ab about boy child. And for this reason, in these communities, like the pastoral communities that uh, face drought uh, every year, you find out that the boys are also missing out on school because as we are speaking, we are in the month of March and these communities have not received rent for the last seven months. So they have moved, the, the men and boys have actually moved the animals to 
some of them are actually crossing borders to go all the way to Uganda to look for grazing and water. And that means that the boys will not be able to come back to school. At some point, they drop out completely. At some point, they are able to come back, but they come back when it's already too late. And when you get to those communities, you'll actually tell from the way the boys are dressing, those who have been to school and those who are not planning to go to school. And those who are not in school, you'll find them that they are the ones who take care of the family animals. The most unfortunate thing is that with the pastoral communities, the children, especially the boys who, who are chosen to take care of the animals, according to the family members, they're the most intelligent boys. They say this, a boy who can, by age eight, can count number of animals and he can be able to account for the animals in the evening. If the animals, if we had 100 cows leaving the, the cow shed and they all come back, that's the best child that is given that responsibility to take care of the animals. In those communities, children that are not quite sharp and uh, maybe academically they cannot be able to do well, especially boys are the ones who are allowed to go to school because the community look at them as a liability. Of course, this has been a great asset to disabled kids in those communities. The parents are not keen about them taking care of the animals, so for that reason, they're able to go to school. But um, climate change has affected the boys and no one really speaks about it. Unfortunately, we all talk about girl child. We have so many movements on girl child and women and no one really takes care of the boys and the men. In these communities, again, as a coping mechanism, especially in West Pokot, a man marries many women. Uh, I didn't understand that from the beginning when I started working with them the last 10 years. But I've come to understand that for men, that's its, its tradition, but it's also a coping mechanism. In a way that if you, you, as a man, you do not have to provide, but you marry seven wives and then your wives are able to fend for themselves. And in that case, as a man, your children will eat and you'll also get some, some food to eat. It's not really a good example, but in the long run, these men are not happy because uh, taking care of uh, many people and big households is not anything that one, anyone could want to get into. And in the real sense, you find out that these men are not very settled and they die very early. You get to those communities and you get a person who tells you they are 50 year old. They really look really aged. Of course, they are living in hot, uh, in very harsh environment, but also socially, they, they have not been really comfortable within their own home settings. Looking at it critically, I think in some situations I've seen where these seven wives actually uh, become friends and uh, they work as a team and they're working as a team against this one man. And in that sense, you can, you, can, you, can, you can guess the emotional stress that the men go through. They don't talk about it. There's no one, there's no organization, no agents concerned about it. But in my opinion, it's an issue that needs to be looked into because when they are not happy, then the issue of gender-based violence actually goes up. When a man is not happy, they will actually come back home. And when they come back home, things will not really work very well for, for women. Look, looking at it again critically, the boys, if they are not going to school as much, even if we try to push the girls to school, these girls have to get their social networks within their communities. They need to get married to their peers in these communities, and they need to interact with the peers. And we live in a society where we have both men and women, and we need to be having very, very friendly and very healthy social interactions. And if the boys are not going to school then, where do we get our girls? I think that has been a challenge in some of the communities where girl child uh, campaigns and uh, women empowerment has, have been very high. Just really, uh, thank you so much, Mary, for that, um, for that testimony. It, it's, I, I think all three of you have emphasized the need to include um, in our analyses, in our programs, in our work, in our, in our policy asks how climate change, climate disruption, migration um, impacts uh, different groups differently. And um, I've lifted up specifically the issue of masculinities, of how I know. The, the link with gender-based violence and uh, misadaptation 
in in as part of the migration process. Um, I think these are these are really important issues that uh, hopefully we need to address more. I'm seeing lots of comments in the chat. We'll come back to that when we get to our conversation. But I still want to talk to uh, to all three of you about donors and what can be done to lift up these issues so that people affected, uh, vulnerable groups, um, but also people who need to be at the table can be more represented. Um, Joycea, you mentioned this, that uh, we don't see enough um, affected communities and women and girls, affected men um, at the decision-making table. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, little, yeah. Let me begin by saying what could be done Investing in women who are working to tackle, uh, tackle climate change, including those who are coming up with new innovations is very critical. Addressing gender equality helps most affected women, making them part of the conversation and ensure that boys and men do not have to suffer through the undertone of patriarchy. So basically what we do is engage both boys and men in our community. We have volunteers in all the villages where we are working. These volunteers are both men and women. And when it comes to transgenders, we found during trans and you know LGBTI community, we under, we realized during the COVID response, even the government on even civil society organization, most of them had left out uh, these communities. There need to be a very special effort to engage because these were not the community we were, uh, which was appearing. When it comes to rural India, in terms of uh, LGBTI community and their agriculture thing, uh, the the backlash on uh, LGBTI and the transgender community so much they most of the time they don't uh, they are not able to stay within the community so they move to cities they're most of the time they are not living in their uh, rural areas because they are always uh, vulnerable in the community uh, that way so they form themselves together from across the places they come and they settle down in one particular you know urban uh, pocket so that they are able to manage their situation uh, their their difficulty so when, when we talk about what could be done basically it is important that we in the integration of gendered perspective into existing climate development and disaster risk reduction policy framework can decrease negative we have to integrate you can't see climate change as separate thing and gender as separate thing because they both need to be integrated and empowering women as agents of social change can improve mitigation and adaptation like we need to have women more at the table in our work what we basically do is we organize the women in the community whether it is for seed bank or organic farming or planting trees or anything or for the village to plan for a disaster risk reduction planning a map of the village how they should be prepared women are part of the task force we have a disaster uh, task force where the more than 10000 cadres of women are trained as for rescuing people from the coastal areas when there is a cyclone or anything so we are making young girls and women part of the process part of the planning part of the mapping part of the you know mitigation and adaptation effort so continuous training and investment in young people is so very beautiful important it's so very important we engage and not just girls uh, we also engage young boys in the community so that they are also part of this process so they can together when there is a disaster or an emergency they can address it together so uh, we invest a lot in the community actually it is very important we invest in people so uh, the beautiful example of the covid situation was when the covid happened there was lockdown nobody could move anywhere but the people in the community the leaders the volunteers, the community organizers whom we had prepared in the community were able to reach out to the people in need. Especially, we also prepared uh, the uh, community well in advance uh, because of the preparation and the training which we had given. We were able to do zero tolerance of violence. Every family could be checked. Our volunteers were there at the ground, you know, to make sure if every family was safe. In all the villages we were working, we were trying to take data and collect information. How were the women and men faring in the home? And if there is any issues, the village volunteers and leaders and the women's group and the self-help group, which we had already formed in place, was able to tackle. And even in terms of getting resources and support, when they had no the work, there was no job, there was no work and everything, the, the, we were able to distribute and support everything, though there was lockdown and then no movement because we had presence in the village. And one of the other thing was the large number of 
casas uh, engagement in most rural most non reachable area by the government through our smaller organizations and networks it's so important that we need to be present and especially we also have church and church related institute churches were everywhere since casa is part of uh, as a church based organization we use the churches in most remote and corner of the uh, country to reach out to people and it was basically done because we had already prepared various church groups we had uh, prepared various women's group for in eventuality of emergencies how women in the communities can take uh, you know things into their hand and manage and another thing is also dialoguing with the government how do we advocate when there is water scarcity when there is a drought we uh, the people's organizations people's movement go to the government to the collector and tell that we need water you are supposed to provide it's your responsibility and also we had groups which are managing water in the community level we are uh, make if, if at all there is a community asset in terms of a well or a tank or a uh, or a pipe hand pump the, the community is supposed to take care of that the community is supposed to you know ration water water with during difficult time so these kind of preparation at the ground is very much helpful flood and cyclone of course we have this uh, disaster mitigation task force members you know which who are trained across the country mostly women first aid teams so these all come very handy to address these kind of things so it is very important to uh, invest in communities and in women and in girls so that they would be able to they, you, uh, they manage the community kitchen they manage the you know old and elderly boys and girls they go they bring them to the community center when there is a cyclone you know if it is going to happen then we prepared we announce the young people go around announced in the village and they inform the community be prepared and come into the shelter you can take care they bring their things so it's a very beautiful community effort of you know uh, taking care of there is a, a, a emergency which is going to happen or which is happening yeah that is for it thanks joyce yeah, that's really inspiring um i want to come back to to uh andrew um being part of present being part of the process presence working with churches networks organizations um are our donors prioritizing this enough, um, what more do you think they can do so that your communities are better represented? Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, particularly in, in relation to slow onset climate change, um, so things like changes in, in when the rain is coming, how much rain is coming, um, what are the temperature ranges, um, the kinds of, the kinds of um, climate impacts that, that farmers all over the world are feeling. Um, there's, I, I think there's just, we're just at the beginning of, of attention and, and investment in understanding how people are feeling these impacts. Uh, there's still very little from the, from the level of, of, of policy research, I think there's still little uh, known and documented, even though people who are feeling impacts directly know it, know it, themselves. So I think we need to find a way to orient donors um, to, to not only invest in, in building up the evidence base, but doing this in a way where, where people who are feeling uh, climate impacts most directly are at least co-steering co that, that process and have a way to name, here's, here's not just what I'm experiencing, but here's what's the pieces of information that, that really need to be, be brought up to the level of, of policymakers. Um, so I think there's there's going to be more opportunities to to encourage um, I think encourage ways to, to 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 connect how people are are perceiving not just climate change but the, the options that you may have regard you know whether they're they're constraint options or, or lots of options um, how are you making the most of the options that you have what are the kinds of uh, additional resources that you would want to to bring to life your your preferred options. Um, there's there's even there's even less I think less been less invested in, in understanding that from the standpoint of of women and girls so making sure that that as um, as this kind of evidence base is built up that that we are paying attention to to uh, intersectionality understanding how how gender affects everybody not only women and girls but ensuring that that women and girls um, are are part of the process in a way that recognizes roles and leadership. Um, that that women are already providing. I think I'll go back to the the point about um, women 
women farming that there's there's I think a, a gap between the kinds of services that are available and the recognition that women are the end users of agricultural extension or the end users of of uh, seasonal weather forecast information and and until we get to a point where um, where women are visible as as consumers of the kinds of of adaptation support that's being offered and really the, a source of expertise on what what adaptation support is needed, then there might continue to be this, this disconnect. That's great. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, Mary, I want to put the same question to you. What, what more can donors do to address the intersection between gender-based violence, uh, FGM, gender inequality, and climate change. Uh, you've said to me on a number of occasions, and it's always stuck in my mind, uh, that there are many um, important documents gathering dust in the ministries of, of government. Um, how, what more can donors do to help uh, community-based organizations and, and agencies such as ours to better address these intersections? Thank you very much. There are a number of things that donors can do running across uh, national, regional, and uh, local levels. To start with, it will be important for the donors to really try and focus on policy-related issues. As I've said before, governments, uh, development partners have uh, developed great policies for specific governments, but unfortunately these policies have not been unpacked for the people who are being affected by climate change to understand and for people who are responding to effects of climate change to, to, to implement. So it's very critical that we focus on the issue of looking, making the policies practical on the ground. And for this to be able to happen in a, a more efficient way, there is need to build capacity along climate change, along gender-based violence, and along uh, community empowerment. We seem to be doing more of reactive. When there is an emergency, the donors will, uh, will throw out a few calls and uh, want to respond to those emergencies. But when the emergencies are over, then we go back to our comfort zone and we wait for another emergency to happen can we have this on continuous basis? Because I think as Andrew has mentioned and uh, all of us has mentioned, uh, climate change is, is getting worse. It's a continuous process and it's getting worse and the, the effects are also getting worse. So can we do this on a continuous basis so that when we have an emergency, we focus more on to mitigation and uh, building communities resilience for the next emergency. And we can only do that if we, we are focusing on uh, action research to be able to inform the people, the stakeholders adequately. People seem to have information, but it's quite scattered in a way that uh, they know that we'll have a drought maybe in the next one or two years, but they don't know how the drought will look like. They know that we'll have floods and we'll have a hurricane somewhere, but no one is really putting uh, things together to, to, to prepare for that. And to be able to educate communities, I think for Africa, the worst part of it that the most people, the people who are affected most do not have the information. They wait until it happens, then they say, okay, it has happened. And that seems to be forgotten very fast. So can we focus more on building capacity around these uh, pertinent issues? and re-implementing the policies and having a continuous sustainable investment into these areas instead of being more reactive. Thank you. Excellent, I uh, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. I think we need continuous engagement, more capacity building, more uh, community-based uh, funded, uh, funded by donors um, and capacity building so that they can access the kind of resources that are now available through the GCF and Adaptation Fund and, uh, you know, these other funds that uh, people like me are in Washington are, are arguing for continued support to these funds, but we continue to be worried that um, 
these large uh, climate migration, climate funds are not necessarily easily accessed by communities on the ground. So we hope that if there are any uh, policymakers that are addressing these intersections on the call, that you you take note of Mary's and and uh, and Andrew's and Joyce's recommendations that we need to have greater connectivity between work that's happening on the ground and the money that is available. Um, I want to open up to some of the questions that are um, that are coming in in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for that. Please put them in. Um, so. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Beatriu uh, Cardona says that the latest UN report on human trafficking shows that 70% of victims are uh, victims of trafficking are women and girls. Migrating contexts provide mafias and organized crime with what they consider to be products to be sold. And some of you have mentioned this already. Climate change and COVID-19 have deteriorated the situation and increased poverty. And thus we need to find a better future. Is there anything that we human beings could do to address this issue of trafficking and um, the production of the creation of products to be sold? Starting with Joycea and Andrew and then Mary. Uh, yes, actually it's very true uh, what uh, we heard about uh, trafficking and girls getting married. I would give you a statistic. Uh, when Cyclone Alia in 2009 in India happened near the ben uh, Bengal Delta, uh, there was a huge number of uh, women who moved into the uh, Kolkata's red light area, 20 to 25% in Greece. So this is uh, women are forced to get into very difficult kind of life. And many girls and young girls are uh, uh, married off or sold off. We have uh, stories where yeah, during the drought situation, parents just retired over the situation, girls are being sold in the community. So this is a very uh, critical issue as we rightly say. And then also we also see uh, in uh, one of the district of Maharashtra, uh, women uh, were uh, giving up on their uterus. There was a special, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, surgery they do so that when they go into the sugarcane cutting, like they, they migrate, they move out of the uh, villages, three, four months, they stay in a place and they continue to work there uh, so that the three months, four months when they are working, they don't want to have their menstrual cycle because the man who has already paid an advance to them will not allow them to take leave. You know, so this is to the uh, a critical level where women are, have to go this kind of subjugation because of very severe extreme cases of you know climatic change where they have nothing the, the, they can't do agriculture in their own land so they move on finding for new job so these are very very uh, very critical and of this also for in India like we want to say in terms of intersection it is mostly the Dalit the caste intersection and uh, minority intersection is very important to uh, talk about because these communities even further or violated and are vulnerable in this situation. So it is important uh, we need to uh, work on these areas, especially uh, we need to invest more and more in terms of engaging women, investing in women, investing in uh, alternate livelihood forms for women. When there is ag agriculture is not possible, what are the allied other industry or other areas where women can work? What are the different sources of income for women? How do we really make sure uh, engage women in a kind of uh, farming, which is more uh, naturally much easier uh, without going into inorganic kind of farming, which is very expensive and put more burden on them. I think so these are some of the things uh, which we can think of uh, uh, when we have to address to help women to come out of this very difficult situation. Thanks so much. Um, Andrew, what more can we do? To Thanks. Just... One, one, one challenge I think that's, that's unfortunately um, still present and probably increasing during the pandemic is the criminalization of, of migration, um, the continued hardening of, of borders, um, which, which is simply forcing people who are on the move to, to take riskier routes. Um, and increasing the exposure to all sorts of threats, threats to, to physical bodies, um, threats to abuse, uh, physical abuse, legal abuse, and including threats of, of, of trafficking. Um, and so I think in, in, in thinking about 
managing managing risks and using the, the, the kinds of models we have for disaster risk reduction, um, it's is really critical to try to decrease the exposure to the threats. And, and that means that that um, policies and responses to, to migration, uh, particularly cross-border migration, need to need to move in the opposite direction rather than than um, making migration more difficult, more uh, risky for people. There needs to be ways to, to, to recognize that people are on the move. Um, steps need to be taken to ensure that, that people can move safely with dignity, have access to essential rights and services, have access to support, um, have access to regular pathways. Um, and that this, this, this wouldn't, this doesn't necessarily address the vulnerabilities that, that, that people may experience at the root that, that could create risk to, to trafficking, but it could create, reduce the, the exposure, uh, especially for people who are already on the move. Thanks, Andrew. Mary, do you have any further thoughts? I'm sure you do. Uh, on the, the um, issue of girls being sold, and you've spoken about FGM, you've spoken about people in the, in the refugee camps. Your thoughts, please. Hey, I'll speak for Africa. I've had an opportunity to interact with the young girls from West Africa who have survived migration. They took a trip to Europe and it didn't work and they were able to come back. And the reality is that um, these young people have been given wrong information. They have been informed that when you get to Europe, you have actually arrived in uh, Ghana. You will get everything that you have been looking for ready, and you can have you can sleep the whole day and enjoy life. So I think as development agencies and uh, like us for church or service being faith based, we need to provide right information to our young people about their countries and also the countries where they would want to go. And if they have to migrate, then they need to use the right procedure. I think the, the cartels and uh, the crooks that are taking these young women for sale, they have found that op uh, open space for them to do that because people have wrong information. And as Andrew has said, most countries have made migration to, to be very difficult. So the first thing is to provide right information. I was also looking at it uh, for a very practical a very practical thing that can happen because people will have to move. Even if you provide the right information, even people, they will be given procedures. I don't think we are going to finish these cartels in the shortest time possible. And for that reason, I think we can work on something to make their journey better because people are going through hell and some of them are not even reaching their destination. Some are dying on the way and when they reach there, they find that whatever they went to do, they, they, they are looking for, they not get it. So we could make the migration route more friendly and we need to provide right information. People do not have right information. I know that in Africa, we are working with the economies that are not good. We have our young people finishing colleges and they cannot get jobs. And for that reason, they feel that if they left their countries, they, they'll get jobs, but we need to provide the right information. That's so important. Thank you very much for raising that, uh, Manaz. I think you, uh, Manaz. Uh, I mean, Mary. I think you, you're absolutely right. I do have a question from Manaz. Um, so, and this is an issue that has come up um, in in a variety of different sectors. Um, and I will read it out. Uh, does the inclusion of women and girls in responding to emergencies translate to economic freedom, or are we in fact adding to what, what appears to be a very long list of domestic tasks and, and more than domestic community-based, farm-based? Um, are we giving, uh, you know, uh, increasing the, the workload by now asking them to be involved in disaster mitigation and preparedness, et cetera. Um, I, I know that there will be lively comments on this. Um, Joycea, can I start with you? What are your thoughts? Yes, yes. I want to, yeah, that's a very interesting and very important question. That's why I very strongly believe that we need to really engage, uh, continue to engage with community. Can I ask Dana to share the 
uh, COVID-19 respond uh, slide of CASA. Uh, what I want to see, here, uh, say here is, yes, it's a very right question. When we engage women into these kind of work, it's even more for them. But it's also for CASA and for all of us working at the community level to bring women out of their home. Mostly these women are confined to their spaces. So when we do this, help them, train them, ask them to come out, they are getting spaces to come out and be sitting in the decision-making table. And uh, during the COVID response, what we did was since we, like, even when it comes to trafficking or women being sold, we have such a large network of women, uh, this slide on the COVID response, uh, which talks about more than 15, 20,000 number of villages uh, where we are connected. Uh, so it helps. Uh, for us, uh, for these women, though it is a little extra burden, see when all of us, when we are coming out, both working at home, working outside and volunteering, it is a little extra for women to do. But it is very important to empower these women. Many of these women then later become the political actors. They contest election, they become the sarpens, they become the community leaders. And what CASA does is we are trying to provide them some kind of honorarium and support. It's not just like it also adds to their local, you know, uh, small income so that they are not whatever hours of services they are providing, though they are voluntarily doing it. This kind of investment is very, very important. When we are engaging people, we are conscious that we should not just use them. You know, it should not be an additional burden, but it uh, gives them the leadership quality. It helps them to engage in the sitting in the decision making table. It helps. Uh, because of these kind of so many men and women who are engaged, it, uh, you know, it helps in operationalizing many, many work and it connects them to different women and uh, for women, it also gives them a kind of empowerment that they can contribute to the larger social cause. So that is how I would like to respond that I don't know whether I was able to fully uh, give the answer, but uh, yes. Uh, it is, it is, it is, it will be definitely a little additional work for women, but there's also something interesting when women are coming out, uh, men in the home are taking up the responsibility of childcare. So that is one thing, like once, uh, when a woman started coming for our meeting, her husband asked who will make the chapatis at home, because it's basically the woman's responsibility to cook. So then the women started talking about it and then the men said the uh, share responsibility. So we prepare the men in the community to share the responsibility. So when we are working with community, it is not just the women who we are training, we are training the men. So the uh, responsibilities are shared. So this doesn't just become an additional work, but uh, the men in the community equally share the household responsibility and they are able to manage all the tasks uh, together and they become empowered women in the last year. Thank Thanks, you. Joyce. Yeah, I think I think that's really helpful. I, I want to put that question to Mary because uh, I know that the CWS Africa program has spent a lot of time working with both men and women, and and there have been shifts uh, uh, seen uh, over the years. Mary, do, is there a downside to involving women or to looking at men's roles? Thank you. Uh, the best way to look at that is to cut out. Uh, agenda analysis within the communities that you work, you go to work with. And there is a tool we use called the uh, uh, daily calendar, where you take both men and women through the daily activities that each gender does from morning when they wake up to the time they go to sleep. And you do this with the two community, with the two groups at the same time. We have done this in some communities and men have been shocked that their women actually work 18 hours a day when they only work six hours. And you go into a deep analysis of that and uh, look at the activities that the women are doing. And in most cases, these 18 hours are spent on doing non-productive activities. I say non-productive in quotes because maybe child rearing is productive. So when the men come to realize that actually they, they are the ones who will start coming up with solutions because they also feel that it's unfortunate that they have been overburdening their women and the men come start giving solutions and saying we would be happy to pick up a few activities from our women. And we have seen that happen. Then on addition to that, you need to build the women leadership, leadership structures. Community leadership structures within those community leadership structures have women representatives. When women representatives and those leadership structures, they will start speaking out, not just for themselves, but for other women and even for the girls. 
And it's going to reach a point because women are good managers. I'm not saying this because I'm a woman. Women are great managers. The men start to respect them. And when the men start to, 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 to respect them, then the two parties start to sit and start to share responsibilities in the community and move forward. Come back, coming back to, you, to, to the question, during the emergency, there is what we call do no harm. And for sure, would not want to overburden women during emergency. And for that reason, again, we need to do a rapid assessment, just understand how things are on the ground and how, how roles can be shared out. But we have to be very strategic here in a way that women must benefit from the emergency response. They must be put in positions that are strategic so that if we are providing emergency relief, then women are, are, are taking, are, are within the, the leadership. If you are providing essential services, then women are within, within the, the leadership. If that does not happen, then there are many challenges. In the African context, as I said earlier, there are communities where women, men have more than one wife. And if this man who has more than one wife is actually the one on the, on the committee for providing relief, then it means that it's really difficult for this, for this man. But if you put women, then actually you are putting these resources to the right hands and for, for right use. So assessments are critical for you to really understand the dynamics on the ground. And then you also involve the community members in the decision making. You don't just wake up, go to the community and say, this is what I want to do. Let community members, let women be sitting on the leadership uh, uh, positions, provide conducive environment for these women to be involved in the decision making. And when that happens, then they will be coming and saying, we feel so and so is having these activities. They're doing this work and they may not be involved in this. But the critical point is to build leadership, community leadership structures and involve women. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. I mean, that's sounding more and more like he for she approaches, which I think um, have been given a lot of emphasis in, in other spaces. Andrew, um, what are your thoughts? I, I, how, how do we address the possible downsides of involving already um, disenfranchised or marginalized or vulnerable communities in this kind of work? What are your thoughts? This is a really important question I, in, in thinking through what's what's now being lifted up as as uh, incorporating mobility into into climate action planning um, perspectives on thinking about mobility and migration as something that that uh, with the right circumstances can be supportive of adaptation and contribute to climate resilience not as ne not necessarily just be a sign of of distress or or, or challenges to adapt um, one of the the sort of activities or, or approaches to, to putting this into practice that I've, I've come across is thinking through um, from a financial planning standpoint, what are the costs involved with migration? What are the costs involved with in-place adaptation? Um, supporting people who are, are considering migration, perhaps likely to migrate, perhaps in a context where there is a lot of migration in response to climates, to do some, some advanced planning. Um, especially important in, in, in contexts where, where people and families have been taking on debt in response to climate impacts and maybe trying to earn money to pay off the debt is what's motivating um, migration in the first place. That would be a point where, where including, um, including all members of the household would be critical to ensure that, that the effects on, on, um, on, all, on men, women, Older people, younger people are all taking into consideration, but also recognizing that that it may be women who are managing the household budgets and actually have the information on what costs are. And so to do a planning exercise in the absence of the person who has the best information means you're going to have an unsuccessful planning planning exercise. I think we all we all have, uh, may know that from our own our, our own work in, in program management. Um, so I think that would be a that could be a very um, a new opportunity and an important uh, point to, to 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 start bringing this up. That's that's an area where CWS may be 
exploring um, based on what we were learning through our, our community research. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so I just want to say that we actually have until uh, one o'clock uh, ET. So there's another half an hour. Um, I don't know if everybody can stay on, but if you can, uh, please do. We have some more questions to, to come to, to run through. Um, there was a question for you, Joycea, about uh, the masculinization of spending. So you mentioned in your in, in your discussion that uh, the masculinization of spending on women or alcohol meant, did you mean to say that gender norms place pressure on men to cope with stresses of climate change in ways that are unhealthy or unhelpful to both them and women? Um, was that, can you say more about that? Um, about that masculinization of spending? And is, it, is there a, a different way that this um, that this can be addressed. <clears throat> yes, actually, yeah, this is one of the serious problem we see in the community when we go, when we meet with women. Uh, for any issue men take up on, you know, have uh, drinks or alcohol as their big source of comfort, whereas women are even become more vulnerable because of this situation. So uh, what we are, uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, the, the sanitation workers from the Dalit community who are made to work in the most unhygienic condition where they have to get into the drainage and where they have to lift the human pieces with their hand, these kind of experiences sometimes, you know, this becomes a, definitely an excuse or the only way of, you know, hiding behind how to, you know, manage their stress or their such worse difficult condition. So how do we really address that? Because it further uh, deprives the family of the whatever minimum source of income, and it deprives the women of the kind of, you know, home uh, peaceful or dignified uh, family which she could have, because this ends up further uh, violence, domestic violence at home increases because of these situations. So what as uh, through our work, what we are trying to do is try to uh, engage the men how productively they can, you know, work and engage themselves during these kind of situation. One of the example is like we undertake a lot of land related activities during disaster, during drought time, during flood time, soon after any emergencies, during this COVID time also. What is these land related activities? Basically clearing the lands, which are non-productive, uh, making the land, uh, building uh, interest, uh, like uh, uh, water bodies, creating uh, uh, farm ponds, farm ones and things like that so that we can prepare the land uh, for uh, 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 for them to make the land more uh, 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 for agriculture uh, better. This is normally done in along with collaboration with the government because government has a lot of programs. We have a very special program for uh, uh, Manrega, which is basically Rural Employment Guarantee Act. We collaborate with government to ensure these schemes are you know, uh, available for these kind of communities when the communities are vulnerable situation. So when men are engaged, uh, engaged in a better manner, when they, we are able to find them sources where they get both men and women, they are able to kind of sometimes tied away the situation. And it is very important we need it. They cannot just uh, uh, use uh, the difficult situation as uh, a reason for them to hide under alcohol. And any villagers we visit, this is one of the key thing women try to kind of share with us. Two things they will say is one is like, uh, we are, you know, violence due to this uh, alcoholism and uh, violence. Uh, and second thing is they uh, engage, being engaged you know, with the agriculture sector when there is no rain and uh, when there is uh, no, uh, they are not able to do, get, get engaged in agriculture. So they need job, they need to work, they need to engage productively. So these are the two things which are very important for both men and women. We need to address that and we need to find ways how we can collaborate with government, uh, private partnership, and how with the uh, uh, international donors and policy makers. So uh, uh, people want uh, to be engaged, to have a dignity of life, dignity of labor, so that they would be able to have self respect for themselves, esteem and so on, so that the social norms can be kind of tackled, not just getting into drinking and you know uh, escaping into escapism, yeah, thanks.
Thanks, Tracia. Mary, uh, you've mentioned the need uh, to focus on boys as, as well as girls, but you've also made clear that we need to have a he for she uh, focus. In your work, what have you found have, you know, to be the most effective approaches for engaging boys and men? What works? What works here, men are supposed to be powerful people and uh, boys are supposed not to complain. Uh, even if they are struggling, they, they don't have to complain. And for that reason, reaching out to boys, the first priority should be for them to be in school. If boys can go to school, finish primary, secondary, and have college education, that will create a, a, a very good space for, for them to be able to move on in life. In areas where they are not able to go to school because of early responsibilities that have given very early by their, their parents and families, I think there's need to approach their families. Just like we create awareness about girl child education, uh, girl child safety and protection, we need to be doing more on a very holistic basis, focusing in those communities where a boy have uh, Boys are marginalized and they're vulnerable. We need to be doing the community uh, sensitization and mobilization on a holistic approach. I think also governments need to start looking into those issues within their policies and coming up with the uh, agencies that are going to focus on boys and men. I think I also mentioned that you have communities in this region where men are, are withering off and uh, in someone's words, they are coming weaker sex in the sense that uh, if they cannot provide for their families, then they are starting to overindulge into alcoholic and drugs. And this is quite common along the communities that engage into fishing as their main livelihoods. I think we have a lot of challenges you know, with the men in the sense that they, within their work, they are also engaging into extra marital sex, and these have been able to lead into infections of illnesses. Looking around communities that uh, do fishing, I think that they have been most affected by HIV and AIDS. And uh, the, in most cases, the, part, the first person who is affected is actually a man. The man who gets infected first, then he's able to bring the disease home. So we need to looking into police issues and how best we we can protect boys and protect many in the long run. Uh, it's going to be quite difficult because like uh, church world service within the region, we do our work majorly in groups and uh, it's very difficult to put men in groups. I don't know whether this is just a, an African thing or something that uh, is in other parts of the region, but we are discovering that working with the younger men, working with the youth, it's much easier to put them into groups. And I think that is likely to be our entry point, get the young men on board and then see how best we could maybe create uh, youth ambassadors on men and uh, boys related issues to get out there and reach out to, to, to the boys and reach out to the men. So that's something that we, we are trying to explore now. It's not an area that we have done a lot of work in. But looking at the research that we are doing currently, I think Andrew mentioned it, the action research that we are doing currently, we have realized that the boy child is actually the most affected. Thank you so much for that. And Andrew, any, uh, any other thoughts? And I also want to ask you, we have a question here, Andrew. Uh, do we have data that represents how climate change is affecting non-cis individuals or non-binary folks? Two, two great questions. I think one of the um, one point I was going to share um, in relation to, to threats um, and men and boys, particularly on the move, um, is with uh, related to sexual violence, um, sexual assault, which is which is um, a reality for for um, men and boys as well as for for women, girls, um, for for transgender persons, gender non-conforming persons. Um, the, there's, I think, from what we've heard from service providers, there's there's often some, there can be some challenges in, in, in 
men and boys accessing um, services in, after after surviving sexual violence. But it's it's critical to be able to provide a, a an emergency response, especially um, to be to be extending access to um, to PEP to post exposure prophylaxis. Um, uh, to reduce the risk of HIV transmission. Um, so for, for service providers to be, um, to be aware of that need as part of their, as part of, um, as part of GBV and, and sexual violence responses, uh, particularly in, in, in migration quarter, quarter settings. Um, regarding, uh, regarding the second question was on, on specific data regarding impact of climate change on person on transgender persons and I'm remembering that can you repeat the question Jasmine sorry I think Jasmine you're on you're on mute let me see if I see it in the chat here sorry yes it is yes so it's a question from Cecilia does any of the panelists data represent how climate change is impacting on non-cis individuals and non-binary folks but in fact I asked it a different way do we have does that kind of data actually exist and where yeah, that's a that's a that's an excellent question, and I I I don't know the answer to the question, and I I don't know within our own um, our own data collection we've we've included uh, the question on the question on gender um, we've we've framed it in a way that somebody could respond to, uh, as to gender identity. Um, so to be able to identify as as they would want to identify themselves, um, I I would I expect that we would we 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 should and, and need to to improve our own ability in, in framing framing the data tools and also working with enumerators and, and people who are collecting data uh, um, to ensure that that. There's an opportunity in in data collection for somebody to to, to self identify in a way that they feel feel safe and confident uh, to do so. Um, generally speaking, there's 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 a scarcity of data just in general um, on on uh, impacts of climate change, specifically as it as it reflects on mobility. So that that does actually create an opportunity that um, to start thinking about about how to ensure that, that data collection is as inclusive as possible to be able to build that in now because a lot of the, the efforts and tools that are that are are going to be uh, I guess more prevalent and more prominent in the next next five, 10 years are, are being developed and tested out at this at this point. Great. Thanks for that Andrew. So we have about 15 minutes left. So I, I we need to start um, closing down. And um, I'm just uh, reflecting on the fact that um, one person has said in the chat that the, uh, I think it was Beatrice who said that um, the first hand experiences have been really, really helpful. So I want to, I want to um, come back to all of our speakers and ask you to pick out, I know it's difficult and I'm being unfair, but can you pick out one personal or first hand experience that you think a policymaker should hear, or many of us in this room, you know, will be going or participating in some way in COP26. And, and again, I want to always bring this conversation back to what should the policy makers be hearing? What one first-hand experience do you think they need to hear to influence their decision-making? I'll start with Joycea. Uh... With regard to policy, I feel uh, the government should engage uh, in terms of investing more in agriculture and uh, sector and avoid investing in things which can create climate uh, uh, disasters. For example, huge infrastructure projects, which, uh, which is anti-environmental which is you know degrading the uh, the coastal areas which is uh, affecting cutting down the forest getting into mining you know these are the women and communities are closely connected to their land their forest their coast and their uh, the community the land where they are living 
when any project infrastructure or uh, you know a, a big monument or you know anything which they want to build which is not directly helpful to the community but at the same time which is anti environment it it affects uh, the community very badly so i would uh, i would i would propose in terms of policy the government should always take uh, 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 how much are we valuing the environment how much it doesn't you know affect the community and the people who are living very close to it uh, in comparison to something uh, an infrastructure which would uh, be only beneficial to a very few minority which is uh, supporting the capitalism so actually this is very much we are seeing today i feel uh, the environment destruction is too huge and in india uh, even the uttarakhand uh, uh, glacier burst and any kind of uh, disaster which we can very easily connect to we not protecting the environment and investing in infrastructures and projects which is benefiting very few capitalist business groups than not the community for their day to day livelihood if we protect that there wouldn't be not much kind of you know this kind of climate disaster and we need to really do it fast and quick all governments across the globe whom are we supporting are we standing with the communities and the people protecting our nature our environment our forest are we standing with the uh, with the uh, with the power and the mighty which is uh, for the sake of few uh, people who are uh, interested in a market economy i should say that yeah i think we need to be very carefully that the policy maker should always count the the people the people who are close to the nature and who are people living in the forest people who are living in the coastal area people who are living in the uh, agriculture community in the land there is very less investment in these things i think policy makers should make huge investment into these kind of communities for them to have a large, better livelihood than investing and many times uh, what do they call they try to uh, help uh, companies and big industrialists you know when they face difficulties but not support agriculture and farmer people who when they are uh, many uh, farmers die in india because of debt and of course the government tried to sometime you know give lot of debt relief and relief and so on i think but these are things which we need to invest hugely and engage hugely than supporting a rich multinationals and corporations which are in the long run very bad for the whole globe and the earth we need to protect our people who are very close to the earth to the nature and engage and invest more that yeah thank you Excellent, thank you, uh, Joycea. Um, Mary, what uh, personal or uh, first-hand experience would you want to take to a policymaker at COP26 from this experience? I would, I would like the policymakers to interpret the relationship between climate vulnerability and livelihoods, especially for the poor countries and what this means to a poor farmer or a poor person in this in these communities. When there is climate change, then everything falls apart. And when everything falls apart, we start having people, we start seeing people move, we start seeing gender-based violence increase, we start seeing all sorts of crime increase. And uh, the policymakers sitting in their Chambers may not really understand what that means, but what it means is that if there is drought, then families are going hungry. Farmers uh, do not have income. And at some point, children cannot go to school. So I would really want them to interpret how climate change is actually leading to lives being destroyed. Very powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Andrew, your first hand experience. Yeah, I'll relate um, something that's that's been in my head since I read it as part of the, the research we're doing um, from a respondent in, in Haiti, um, who when asked uh, the reasons um, they had they had migrated, uh, the main the response was the main reason I left is to search for life because misery wanted to kill me and my children. And 
for me, reading reading that on the page, um, I lost my researcher hat for a moment. And first was was just human and feeling feeling the, the emotion that somebody was conveying in their response. Um, then also thinking that that's that's almost the exact formulation that that our colleagues who work in our, our Kenya office and interview refugees who are explaining their their stories and, and their persecution claims. That's almost the exact formulation of a statement that we would expect to come across in our claims, except replace misery with militia or armed group or, or a, a source of violence that would be recognized as persecution under, under refugee law. Um, in the context of, of climate change, um, the, the idea that, that climate is creating such fear that and contributing to it. It's not necessarily that it's only the climate impacts, but it's adding to the threats that people face and experience and that are causing causing fear and in, in, in most extreme circumstances, fear for life. That that's something that that we as a as a community and policymakers need to hear and find a way to respond to. And and we're not in, in the research we're doing, this is not something we're we're hearing or seeing in most of the responses. It's very few. I would, um, which is which is in a way a good sign that there's still time to create and expand protections, um, create opportunities for people who are moving to move safely, create more support for people who, who are looking to have a place to have it, um, where we don't face an increase in, in, in those threats. Um, but the time to, to create new new protections and new mechanisms is now. It's not to wait until, until we're, we're seeing that in the majority of, of the survey responses, I think. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Um, thanks to everybody. Um, I want to end with um, a quick snapshot of what the ACT Alliance is, is doing in this space. Um, as you know, I have placed a lot of emphasis on COP26. Not all of you will necessarily be going to COP26 and not all of you necessarily work in the climate space. But we have uh, organized this event because the, everything that Andrew, Joyce, and Mary uh, have spoken about today is already happening, has been happening for many years. And there is, uh, unfortunately, um, an increase of all of these negative impacts. Um, uh, compounded now by the pandemic. However, as Andrew has just said, we do have a space in which we can still respond, we can mitigate, we can uh, reach out to our members of Congress and we can reach out to our governments and our legislators and our representatives and we can encourage them to pay attention to the climate and gender relationship. Um, what the ACT Alliance is doing, it has uh, climate and gender justice, peace and human security, migration and displacement, emergency preparedness and humanitarian response. Uh, this is the core of what we do. And as you will see, this uh, event has addressed pretty much everything uh, in this act, uh, in, in, in this act uh, uh, image here. Um, we will be represented at the COP, uh, at COP26 in Glasgow, um, and uh, climate justice and gender justice will continue to be um, part of the stories that we tell and the asks that we have and the, the demands that we make of our governments as we ask for a scaled up response to the climate crisis, which puts people first and which is which, which promotes gender equity, which promotes uh, transformative uh, gender roles, more power, economic, social, and political for women and girls, uh, but also more attention to the, um, the impact of climate change on boys and men and, and, and all other groups. Um, so thank you so much to everybody for being part of this conversation. Special thanks to Joycea from India. I don't know what time it is in India. I think it's probably quite late for you. It's probably quite late for Mary as well. Thank you so much for doing this. Andrew, you're in my time, in my time zone, but thank you very much again. Uh, really, really appreciate all of your, um, your experience and your inputs and your thoughts and your reflections and your insights. Um, this event would not have been possible without two people whose names I'm going to call. 
uh, Rachel Taverno from the Act Alliance, and Diana Murasan from Church of Service. I am lost without the both of you. Can I just say it publicly? Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who signed on, who stayed with us for the last uh, couple of hours. Really appreciate your thoughts and your comments and your inputs. You will get a copy of the, um, the, uh, the slides that have been done. And uh, we have also put in the chat some resources for you all to, um, to use going forward. Please get in touch with us. Uh, we can quickly put our emails in the chat in our closing five minutes. Um, but from us here, from the Act Alliance and Church of Service and CASA, thank you so much for coming on.